Thank you. So, it's a pleasure to be here. I have in here my instant Finnish. Hello, it's a great pleasure to be back in beautiful Finland. The sun is shining and the future is already here. Hey, se on suuri ilo olla takaisin kauniissa Suomessa. Aurinko paistaa ja tulevaisuus on show täällä. Was that good? There you have it, my instant finish. Uh, science fiction is becoming science fact. The other day I was in Japan at a sushi restaurant and I had a conversation with the sushi chef for half an hour in Japanese and I spoke in German. As long as we keep it simple, it's working. This kind of thing is truly Star Trek. You can expect in a few years we'll be able to speak fluently, more or less, not like we're speaking, but very close, in what, 30 languages. Imagine what's going to happen to call centers. 21 million people work in call centers. 95% of those, the machine can probably substitute at least sort of on the superficial level, right? As long as compassion isn't required, which you're not getting from call centers anyway. <laughs> so uh, the future is here. It's, our, it's, it's everywhere. We just have to pay more attention to it. You know, and sometimes I say so, uh, jokingly, there can be experts on the past, but you can't really be an expert on the future. Right. You have to have imagination. That's the most important skill. So I'm going to start with this and saying, uh, this is really what I do, it's my job, right? is to listen, to observe. My job is not to predict. I think that's extremely difficult. I mean, just 20 years, you can say that that's a tall order to think about 20 years. Right? I mean, my job is to do this, and I have the saying, assume less and discover more. There's a great South African proverb that says, assumptions are the termites of relationships. Especially in business, it's funny, you know, we, we tend to assume that we, we can just repeat what used to work and it will continue to work and then it will just be better or faster. Right? But let me remind you of one thing, the, the future is not an extension of the present. It is the complete opposite. I, mean, I used to be in the music business, we sold records, you know those, those round things that, you know, plastic, yeah? We sold records. Do you sell records today in the music business? You don't, it's in the cloud. Uh, in fact, you could say today, you don't sell music at all. It's 20 million songs on Spotify for 10 euros. I mean, we can hardly call that selling music, right? It's a whole different universe. So we have to pay attention to what's going on. Here's an example. Right? I mean, this curve shows you we're living in one of the most amazing times in human history. I mean, the things that are becoming possible, robotics, uh, genome sequencing, energy storage, solar energy, self-driving cars, speaking machines, uh, you know, all kinds of things that we use every day now, making free phone calls and having music in the cloud and any TV program we want. I mean, it's, it's exciting. And then we have stuff like this where we say, wow, human genome sequencing, the, the cost of DNA sequencing, Used to be $100 million, now it's $850. In five years, it'll be $5. In 10 years, it'll be completely normal. You can have your DNA sequence on your mobile phone in 10 seconds while you're arranging the next date. So if you're looking to quickly get an answer on your healthcare problems, that will be boom, just like that. Mind-boggling future. And also, of course, quite scary when we look at these, what I call the game changes in, in my book. Uh, it's basically eight different things. There's the cloud, data, the internet of things, thinking machines, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, the blockchain. I mean, it's enough to make your head spin <laughs> when you're not deeply inside, like, oh my God, you're, this is all happening at the same time. And they're all coming together to create new possibilities. I mean, think about Airbnb, for example, right? how Airbnb wouldn't be possible without the mobile phone, without social media, without the cloud, without intelligence. If you're looking to rent your place in Airbnb, you don't have to guess how much it's worth. You let the artificial intelligence find out all the places around you to determine the price for your rent in four seconds. I mean, it used to agonize for hours about how my apartment is going to be rented for how much. Now it's four seconds. Right? I mean. Mind-boggling. 
So these game changes are what we have to understand in the future. There's eight of them, and, and uh, we can look at more detail when we uh, talk about the other slides later. So basically what we see here is a, a move towards the future to where we can safely say that I sometimes call this the digital transformer, where everything around us is becoming smart. You know, 90% of people that want to talk to me, they want to talk about digital transformation. <laughs> it's so funny that we always joke around the office and say, what is actually digital transformation? But basically, uh, just to sort of use a more cartoon language, you know, you stick in the old business, you put it in the transformer, and out comes the smart business. So that is smart banking, that does exist. Yeah. Smart insurance, smart media, right? smart cities, smart environment, maybe even smart politics, yeah? Maybe even a possibility of connecting everybody there. I mean, we're looking at a world that's in totally different, smart everything, that's the low-hanging fruit. And here's the challenge. When we talk about the world getting smart, there's gonna be a lot of wisdom required to figure out what do we do about the data? How do we keep it safe? Of course, you know that everything that connects is a benefit, but when it connects, it creates also risk. We can't have one or the other without having them both together. Right? I mean, this is a huge challenge. I always say that the more we connect, the more we must protect. And that's a strange thing to say, obviously, because it's hard to be connected and then protect. You know, right now we're connected with maybe mobile banking or media or music. But in the future, our healthcare records, our driving, our food, our banking, going into the cloud. We talked about this earlier, right, in the discussion on the, on the stage here. The bottom line really on this is that trust isn't digital. You know, trust is not something you can download. You say, now, well, how do I download an app for this relationship? It's something that we feel. And there's a fundamental problem with technology. Technology doesn't feel anything. No. Why should it and how should it, right? It doesn't exist. If you've seen the movie Her, anybody seen the movie Her? <laughs> it's this amazing film where the, the guy falls in love with his operating system and his, his computer. It's a daily occurrence now. And he finds out at the end, you know, the problem with the computer is it doesn't have a body, it doesn't exist, and it has 3,640 other relationships at the same time. Because it doesn't exist. So it's very important for us to realize you know, what it takes in that future is to navigate those game changes. That's for business, government, for ourselves. What do we do? What do we not do? And I have suggested many times before, I'll say it again, I think we need every politician, every public official, and of course CEOs as well, to have a driver's license. To get a driver's license for the future. I mean, I live in Switzerland, and I can tell you, when I speak to politicians about the future, they talk to me about copyright law. Right? Like, what are, you, what are you talking about? We're talking about genetic engineering, we're talking about intelligent machines, we're talking about quantum computing, and you want to find out what's up with the legal downloads? We're talking about automation of jobs up to 40, 50, 60 percent of our routine jobs. About changing education to keep up with technology. And you know, I'm always saying this, I'm an optimist. I think all of these game changes will power our society in unprecedented ways. But not with us, without us taking charge of it. You know, the funny thing is about technology is, I think you all noticed this by now, technology does not solve social or political problems because it doesn't understand them. These are emotions, right? These are about trust, these are about humanity. Technology doesn't know what to do with this. I mean, technology, even the most advanced technology is binary, right? Yes, no, yes, no, if this, then that, input, output, right? That's not how humans work. In fact, you could say that technology has made social political problems worse. Amplified them as we see with Facebook and social media, I'll comment on that later. So that's something we have to keep a very good eye on. Which way are we going? Do you know how to navigate these game changers? I mean, if you're a business person, then this is just your own business that, that may be at issue here. But if you're running a, a state, if you're the mayor of Helsinki, 
you're going to have to really understand this because I'm not, I'm not talking about 50 years here. I'm talking about five years, 10 years, maybe 20 years at the most. We're all going to see the rise of technology to be infinitely capable in our lifetimes. Even me. The kids of our kids will live to be between 100 and 120 years old because of technology. And there's already about 40 companies in San Francisco in the Bay Area talking about the end of dying. I mean, this is kind of a bizarre story, right? But this is real. This is a business proposal. How much would you give to live forever? So, uh, chapter three in my book uh, is uh, about the mega shifts. And you can download this entire chapter for free at megashifts.digital. And basically what it says is that, you know, we're not living in a world where transformation is just digitization. Or it, it's actually 11 things coming together at the same time. Robotization, virt uh, virtualization, automation, platformization, which I'll talk more about, they're co all coming together. And when you have this many things moving, you're not going to find an objective yes or no answer. I get this question all the time, is this right or is this wrong? Is AI good or is it bad? Okay. Well, the answer is, of course, it depends. I mean, we're talking about technology here. Is a telephone bad? A telephone is bad because it can lead to the fact that you won't go over there and make a personal visit. That's what people argued about the telephone. Technology always has both, you know, both parts to it. And we have to keep a very good eye on this. So now you have businesses now moving into domains where they don't even belong, like Facebook is now rumored to offer a cryptocurrency, a digital currency. 2.5 million people are going to be connected on Facebook money, digital money. Now we have the biggest companies in the world getting into healthcare, Amazon and JP Morgan. Now you have, of course, Apple getting into healthcare. Everybody is getting to, into everybody else's turf. And now you have all these things happening, for example, BMW and Mercedes are teaming up for mobility. This is the lesson that we must learn for ourselves. Look outside of your current domain. You want to be successful in the future? Look outside. The future competitors for a bank or for whatever is not going to be the other banks. I mean, go back to the music business. Who is in charge of the music business now? Sony Music, EMI, Universal, so they still hold the licenses to, you know, Michael Jackson. And they have to give those, and they collect money for that, right? But who is really in charge of the music business today? YouTube, Spotify, and everybody else that's out there in the tech world. So this is a lesson that we have to learn also when we think about the future. And we're going into a future that is going to be sucking us into a huge digital vortex. And there's not much we can do about not doing that. I mean, we can say, okay, we won't participate. Uh, offline is the new luxury. I agree on that. And I, it's going to be very hard for us to not opt into some of these things. So the future skills that we need. First, observation. If I ask you about what's going to happen in the next five years, do you have an answer? Whether it's about your country or your city or your job or the role that you're in, that's important. Understanding. Understanding is not facts. Understanding is understanding the things that are between the facts. Having the context. And knowing more than the machine. Imagination. Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. That was very easy for Einstein to say. He was a genius. Right? But what do we need our kids to know? I mean, our kids are going to grow up in a world where some statistics say 70% of all new jobs haven't even been invented yet. And 50% of those jobs aren't going to be jobs, they're going to be gigs, called in the gigs economy. I mean, what do our kids, our kids and ourselves, what do we need most and foremost? Creativity, imagination, intuition, understanding, you know, the human part of what we are. Creation. If you're going to teach your kids anything, this would be it. Imagination and creativity. Because that's every job is going to require this. Everything else will be done by machines. You can see that clearly shaping up and with which way it's going. That's what I call the future mindset. 
And I think this is what we have to have here in Europe. You know, we used to think that Europe is behind. I mean, I lived in America for 14 years, and everybody in America used to laugh about Europe, you know, how slow we are, can't agree on anything. Uh, and, you know, the slow democratic process. You know. So, however, now today we're finding out that actually there's one great thing that we have here in Europe. And that is that we're all humanists. We all want to be human, basically. You can't say that about Silicon Valley. You'd be surprised to hear. They want to be superhuman, not just human. So the great thing that we have in Europe is that if we take the future mindset and we put that with humanity, I think we have a great story for the future. That's why I'm such an optimist about what I call the United States of Europe. That sounds crazy, right, to say that today, looking at all the trends that go against it. But I think this is really important. So looking in the future, this is really what's happening. Humanity and technology are converging. I mean, essentially, my mobile device is my external brain, my second brain. My music isn't there, my news isn't there, my dating isn't there, if, you, if I was to do dating, my banking, and so on. And for some of our kids, it's the first brain. It's all they use, right? Just everything is in there. So we're going to converge in this way, and I would say we're going to change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. I'm, I don't mean this as a threat. Don't misunderstand me. I think this is going to be amazing. But every potential needs to be channeled. Every technology that's amazing needs to be put in the context of why it's amazing, what it's supposed to do. And it needs to be for everybody. You know, not just for the ones that can afford a, a million euro genetic engineering operation so they can live longer. And we have to use some imagination on this and see which way we want to go. Three things that matter here most. First, we're changing exponentially. You've heard this many times before, Moore's Law, Metcalfe's Law, but the fact is we are exploding, right? Every 18 months, we're, we're doubling the power of technology. And then we have all these different sciences coming together. Nanodesign, nanoenergy and material design, artificial intelligence, supercomputing coming together, and now you have sectors like in, medical, in the medical world where information technology and biotech are converging. I don't know if, you, I know if any of you take any pills, for example, cholesterol pills or statins. Do you really think in 10 years we're going to take a pill that solves these problems? We'll still be taking some pills, but there are so many things that we can do with technology to monitor, to prevent, to read our DNA and say, if you do this, then this will happen because it happened to 2 million other people. I mean, every pharma company in the world will become a technology company. And many tech companies are looking to get into healthcare. This is convergence. So three things, exponential, combinatorial, convergent. When you talk about the future of government, this is what we have to think about. This is not going to be a gradual process. It's going to be a leaping process. It's going to be combinatorial. It's going to converge with other industries. The most important thing in this formula, using this triple formula, is that we make sure that everything that we do is human-centric. Because this is not about efficiency. We should not make efficiency more important than humanity. This is a great thing that we always do. You know, we look at technology and we say, oh, this is much more efficient, so I use Tinder, I just swipe and boom, I have a date, you know? But it's not the same thing. I can download the app on my iPad to make me an instant DJ in 10 hours. But that's not the same than being a musician that has studied for 10,000 hours. It doesn't mean it's bad, it's just different. We have to understand how this comes together because this is really what's happening, right? Science fiction is becoming science fact. I use this as an image of saying that we're essentially becoming sort of superhuman. I don't know if you've ever tried, for example, a HoloLens virtuality glasses. You feel like when you wear this, you can, you can see the world at a thousand times as fast. <laughs> it's going to be mind-boggling. So here's a couple of examples.
I'm going to stop it here because, you know, I could go on for the next two hours. Basically, the way that we're looking at this, we're saying, God, this used to be, you know, this used to be straight out of Star Trek. Right? I mean, a, a tube that goes into, a, a train that goes into a tube and goes 800 kilometers an hour with a hyperloop without crashing, connecting Abu Dhabi and Dubai, that's already being built. Right? I mean, mind-boggling. Right? So, many people look at this and they're saying, oh my God, the future is going to be terrible. Because it's all happening, it's overwhelming. Right? The last three years I talk to people when I'm traveling and almost everybody says the future is not going to be good. This is not just because of Donald Trump, right? Uh, or the Brexit. There's two major arguments. One, climate change, which is a huge challenge for us and something that is unavoidable for us. And the second one is the robots will come and then they will take our work and after that, they'll kill us. Huh? I mean, this is a serious concern. We talked to a 25-year-old kid that's saying, what should I learn? Because the bots will learn it all anyway. Maybe we'll just, you know, become a, a robot repair person. What you don't know about your garage door will kill you. It's official. You can't eat wheat bread. Someone's, Someone's been, been stealing, stealing packages. packages. They call them porch pirates. Porch pirates. <laughs> All I'm saying is that in five years, robots will be able to do your job, your job, your job. Are you listening? Always, Denise. In a world full of fear. Simply safe. On. Home is the place you should simply feel safe. Now, here's a commercial for a company that makes a home surveillance system. And their argument is the world is going to be bad, right? I mean, this is really what we're up against. But I think really what's happening is that it's actually the opposite. The future is better than we think. We just don't hear about it enough. If you watch any movies, you're going to watch Black Mirror and Ex Machina and Transcendence and, you know, and you're saying, oh my God, this is all going to happen, it's terrible, because the AIs are here. So this is something we have to think about because these are the facts, right? Declining poverty. Hans Roesling talked about this a lot in his talks, right? Uh, rest in peace. Life expectancy increasing. You know, we're all going to live to be close to 100 in the near future. Child mortality, basically, not going towards zero, but very close. Solar panels, that's been clear for a long time. And what's even more important, of course, the cost of batteries. I mean, I could give you a hundred facts like this and saying, well, the present is already better. <laughs> and so let's not worry too much about that because the bottom line really is this. In this world, right, there's a bunch of things that we're going to achieve in the next 20 years. And they sound really crazy right, when you think about this. We're going to solve food. We're going to solve water. We're going to solve energy. We're going to solve diseases. There's one thing we can't solve this way, and that's this, right? How we govern wisely. And that's your job, right? You're, you're doing this here. That's why we're here. How do we govern wisely? Because we can't download that, yeah? Wisdom is not something we can download. Trust is not something we can get on an app or on the internet. These two things, Data and artificial intelligence are changing our world completely. Today, if you talk to anybody in business or otherwise, it's all about who has the data, who makes money with the data, who has the intelligent machines. I mean, I heard earlier about Europe becoming sort of a, a leader in this issue of AI. I think that's, th that's going to be a tough one. <laughs> but, you know, clearly, I mean, this is, uh, McKinsey says, a $150 trillion economy. Just those two things. And it's US and China, that's it. Now, our researchers tend to go there to do this work. And here's the fact of, you know, what's happening in this, what I, what I call the platform economy. Right? The companies that use data and artificial intelligence are becoming empires, you know, platform companies. More powerful than Standard Oil. Many of them are my clients, so I have to be careful. But think about this for a second, where this is going to take us. Look at these numbers. These are the top 20 platform companies, technology companies. The top four of these guys have more money than the GDP of France. I mean, basically, they could buy France. I don't think they're thinking about that, but... I mean, this is the powerful situation. Are we going to see regulation here? Absolutely. I mean, these companies are more powerful than oil and gas ever was. Or banking. That brings me to Facebook. 2.4 billion users. 40% of people uh, in most developed countries get their news on Facebook. 
And what news do they get? They get a the news that's curated by an AI, by an artificial intelligence, to, to help me stay there as long as possible so I can buy more stuff or look at more commercials. It's a mind-boggling situation. I left Facebook nine months ago after a lot of debates, you know, in terms of being a user. And I think this is really what's happening. And when we think about what, what happens there is that we both get addicted to social media. I'm, I'm sure you know what that means, right? Uh, we're sort of the crack of the, uh, of the nervous system. And we get inside of this and then we, we believe the stuff that's in there. Our mind is being distorted. We don't have objective news anymore. And we're being data mined. And all in the name of making lots of money. You know, Facebook is the most successful digital company in the world ever since they went public. In terms of making money, if you had invested in Facebook, you would have made the most money of any company in digital. That's changing now. Because now the big question is really this, you know, what happens with technology? Of course I remember the code. It's 4452? Four, four, four. This guy looks amazing. I look amazing. I should take a selfie. Did I forget to lock the front door? So this is a pretty amazing commercial by Google. Hey Google? Hi, what can I do for you? That ran during the Oscars. And this is for the Google Assistant. The Google Assistant will do hundreds of things for you in the future. We'll make a phone call, book your airplane ticket, figure out where and how to vote, you know, what date to get, whatever is around you, not just the Google Maps. That's what Google attempts to do. I, I put in a second trailer here from Google because I think you have a good laugh. Uh, if you know Hell, uh, The Space Odyssey 2001, if you know that movie, this, this clip will surprise you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hey, Google, open the pod bay doors. So, uh, quite clearly, hell refuses, but Google does the job. I mean, this is a bit of a joke of Google, which I can appreciate, right? And I do speeches for Google just to divulge this. But I think too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. That's really true with all drugs, and especially with technology, which is kind of a drug. You know? We don't want to outlaw this period, but we have to think about what if I let Google do 200 things every single day? Would that decapitate me, sort of make me unskilled? Would I forget how to do stuff myself? Would this happen? I mean, clearly, the more we outsource, the more we sort of, you know, get dependent on it. And so I think really our biggest problem is not today that the machines will come and kill us, but that we become too much like them. We get lazy. We don't want to do anything anymore because there's a shortcut. We basically give everything to technology. That's why we should keep on voting in paper. Even though I'm certain that we're going to have that shift to digital voting. Uh, but for the time being, that we're doing that because it's human and right? it works. We have to think about what, where that's going to take us in the future. I mean, this is the key question. Now, who is mission control? Who controls what goes on there? Who's in charge? A famous philosopher said 50 years ago, technology is not what we seek, but how we seek. Technology is a tool. And I think if you go to Silicon Valley, technology not, is not a tool anymore. It's God. Technology is the purpose of life. And so I, hear, I think in Europe we have this belief that we want to remain human. Right? We want to technology serve us. And, and this is what we have to do. We have to re-humanize technology. Make it human again. If Facebook is serious about changing, they should hire 30,000 journalists. God knows it wouldn't even matter to their bottom line if they hired that many journalists. But Facebook is intent on building a machine. So humans are in the way. We're just the fodder for the advertising. Tim Cook from Apple said the other day at the European Commission meeting, he says, technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want anything. How should we expect technology like the cloud or quantum computing or genome engineering or intelligent machines? Why would we expect them to want anything? This is a machine. 
It doesn't think. We can call it a thinking machine, right? It, it does a certain kind of thinking, right? But it's not like us. I mean, the stuff that we can do as humans is like this, yeah? If I meet you later, it takes 0.4 seconds for me to measure you and for you to measure me in 0.4 seconds without saying a single word. That's called, you know, generating trust or not. Machines don't do that. So this is really important for us to think about this when we live in a world where constantly machines are telling us what we can or cannot be doing. We should use that as a tool. I use TripAdvisor. I love TripAdvisor. But do I go eat everywhere that TripAdvisor tells me? That would be a disaster. It's just a tool. It's a hammer to which I use to build something. I don't want to end up like this. I don't know about you, but I think this is the question of not saying yes or no, but saying, you know, until here and no further. And this is why we also need to think about social contracts, regulation, and so on. This is very much like the environmental issues that we're facing. I call this digital pollution. It's basically like this, you know, all the stuff that we're doing is causing us to see things differently, causing isolation. The most suicides, the highest suicide rate in the world is not in some place, in some country. It's the power users of social media. They're the ones who kill themselves the most. <laughs> it's doing the opposite that it's supposed to be doing. Right? I mean, when you think about this for a second, right? we have to address the externalities of technology, the side effects. Because right now, I can tell you, now today we're here and we're talking about these issues that we discuss, but in 10 years, these issues will be a thousand X. I mean, imagine a world where you're not longer just addicted to your mobile phone, but to augmented reality to wearing glasses that make you super smart and super fast. That's coming. A, a world to where you work at home in a virtual reality room. You don't have the human contact anymore. So I think we need a stronger focus on ethics, values, social contracts, corporate accountability, balanced regulation. And this is truly a job for the wise man, women. In fact, I think this is primarily a job for women. <laughs> because it requires a certain emotional intelligence that we have to learn. And we can already see that, right? Politicians are getting younger around the world. We're having more women. This is a good trend that we need to uh, support and amplify. Uh, we talked about artificial intelligence before. Clearly, every single company in the world is bent on using artificial intelligence to reduce the overhead, okay? to make it faster, quicker, you know, more convenient. And I work with a lot of big multinational companies, and I can tell you between the lines, or you know, basically on the line here, uh, their primary uh, purpose for doing this is to save on salaries and reduce headcount. That's the primary purpose. Automation, reduction of staff, because humans are expensive, and they mess up. They're a pain. So here, I would say the first three quadrants, assisted intelligence, you know, Devices you speak to, automation, augmented. I think most of that is pretty interesting and probably quite good. The fourth one, having machines that can be like us, it's a very bad idea. Giving uh, robots human rights, right? that discussion is already going on. <laughs> Acting like those can be our lovers. Machines that we built for those purposes. That's taken it just a tiny bit far, I think. And that relates also to the second biggest threat that we have and opportunity, genetic engineering. You heard about the Chinese doctor, right? Three months ago, who is now in jail, who was the first guy ever to change the human genome, the germline, in two babies so that they wouldn't get an HIV infection from their father. And it worked. I mean, we're talking about fundamental changes. If we don't agree on what we want, it would be sort of an arms race. But on the positive side, think about all the amazing stuff that we can do here. We can heal diabetes. We can prevent Alzheimer's, maybe even cancer one of these days. 400 million people in the world suffer from diabetes. Could that help? Yeah. But it could also build a super soldier, something we have to think about. So really, my solution to this is I have proposed many times, we need a digital ethics council. 
We don't just need people that deal with business and how we're going to be faster and transform our businesses. This is transforming our lives. The question really is, are you going to be on Team Robot or are you going to be on Team Human? Can you make robots and be on Team Human? You can. But the question to me is, how do we get this done? How do we put the human back inside? And that is what makes us Europeans. Putting the human back inside. Not rejecting technology, not going backwards, not being anti-competitive. Right? But still, what is the, the value of the future if the future is going to be dehumanized? I mean, why would you want to live in a world where everybody is completely connected, but we've lost what makes us human? Mystery, serendipity, discovery, imagination, creativity, all these things. Because here's the bottom line, you know, technology doesn't have this. Technology could be both. Technology has no ethics. And this is what we have to ask of technology companies. Even though your code and your technology does not have ethics, it doesn't live, so it can't, but you must. You must do the right thing. And of course, this is difficult to define. Right? Yeah, I'll try this definition of ethics. It's knowing the difference between what you have a right to do and what is the right thing to do. I mean, if you're in government, this is the key question. You may have a right to do this, but is it the right thing to do? And this is where Facebook fails 150% of the time. It has the right to do this, and there's nothing different in the terms of use. They're not being criminal, and they're not misleading us. They just do ethically the wrong thing. And that's something I think that we need to be careful of, because this is the world that we're going into, right, in the very near future. A world that I call the quadruple bottom line. People, planet, purpose, prosperity. In a world that's just about prosperity, it wouldn't matter. The biggest business in the world is to sell out humanity. To substitute what we had with some sort of technology. I mean, isn't it pathetic that the place where we communicate the most is the place that makes most of the money from our communications, social media? We don't hardly communicate in person anymore. I mean, many people are like, they have more relationships with their screens than they have with themselves, with others. So this is something we have to think about. Where are we going with this? And I think it's the world that's also going away from this old-fashioned approach of, you know, it's all ours to a new ecosystem. You see companies like Patagonia and Unilever and others going in this direction. I think we're going to have a stock market for these companies in the future. Maybe this is a good idea for Finland to start such a stock market. A company that's measured by four different points, not just by one. So if we move in this direction, I think a new economic logic is evolving and coming. I'll give you another quote from Tim Cook because uh, this talk was pretty amazing. So just very shortly. And those of us who believe in technology's potential for good must not shrink from this moment. Now more than ever, as leaders of governments, as decision makers in business, and as citizens, we must ask ourselves a fundamental question. What kind of world do we want to live in? That's pretty amazing for a CEO of a tech company. You can argue, of course, many things about Apple. I will not get into the details here, but this is the question. What do we want? In 10 years, we can be anything because technology will be able to do whatever it is that we want to do. This is the question we have in countries, in Europe, and we have to get together to define what that is. Do we want to be human, or do we, do we want to merge with a machine? Do we want to compete with China and have faster soldiers because we have genetically engineered them? What do we want? With artificial intelligence, it's quite clear machines are becoming intelligent. But fear not their intelligence. I mean, when we think about this graph here unfolding, it's quite clear that we're not going to keep up with them. Technology is exponential, and we are not. I mean, even if you get to be 100 or 120, we're just not going to keep up with the machine. I mean, there's no way you can memorize Wikipedia in 12 seconds. But what's the difference there? 
I sometimes say when human intelligence meets artificial intelligence, it's the end of business as usual. And fill in the blanks there, it's the end of education as usual, the end of politics as usual, because now we have to rethink what we are and what we want. Good news is this one. Human intelligence is a lot more complex than computing. I think you all know that in, uh, instinctively, this is what machines do. They have infinite potential to compute any number of, of information. But human intelligence is social, it's intellectual, it's emotional, kinesthetic, our body, it's musical. Experts say it's about 10 different types of intelligence. That's why it's so hard to test intelligence. Will a computer a ever have emotional intelligence? For that, it would have to exist. Do we want a computer to exist? I kind of doubt it. But I think thinking machines, as my colleague Paul Sappho says, we should not mistake a clear view for a short distance. These machines can think because they can look at data and so, but not like us. You know, when you think of your husband or your wife, you don't go to the back of your head and you pull out a JPEG and say, oh, that's my wife, right? It's a little bit different than that. That's what a computer does. It's really quite different. So in this future, we have to keep reminding ourselves what machines do and what we do. Computers are very good at, at navigating the whole space, but they cannot get right away to a complex point like we can because of our perception, because of our creativity, because of who we are as humans. And computers don't have the ability to understand things apart from data and information. Data and information is not knowledge, it's not wisdom, it's not understanding. Nevertheless, these tools will be extremely powerful. Exactly for that same reason, because we can do all these things totally instinctively and also very energy efficiently with our brain that machines can't do. So when you look at movies like this one, take it with a grain of salt. Don't base your estimate of the future on this. It's entertaining, but here's the future of AI, boring nuts and bolts data jobs. I mean, when you see the difference between those two, this is what companies actually do with AI. Right? Image recognition, stats, and you know, all this. It's, it's far away. So we should not think about that as a threat right now. We should think about that as a threat in the future. But I think really it means for us that in this world, the world where we can get more information easily, we have to become more human, not less. We can, we're not going to compete with computers on being smart. I used to think I'd like to be this, you know, smarter, better, faster, not sleep too much and, you know, not waste all that time on all the other stuff. But now I think, like, I think it's really important for us to become more human, not to become smarter, but to become more human. That's our leg up in the future. If you can be both smart and more human, of course, you know, that's, that's the holy grail right there. More human, not less. If you know the movie Blade Runner, there's a great scene where the guy who creates the replicants says, you know, this is where we can create machines that are more human than human. Remember that quote from Blade Runner. I think this is really important for our future to think about this way. And this is one reason why we should not focus in business or otherwise too much on this. Efficiency. I mean, if it's all about efficiency, we wouldn't exist. We are the most inefficient thing that you can possibly imagine. We change our mind, we lie, we make up stuff. We have foresight, we have visions, we have imagination. We're not logical. So if the computers will take over and they're efficient, then there's no room for us there. So efficiency is really not, I always say efficiency is for robots. By all means, in our business, we should strive for efficiency. But efficiency is not the purpose of technology. <laughs> it's to reinvent what we do and how we do this. So to summarize, in this game that's queuing up for us, we have the same cards we've always had. Humanity, ethics, values. I think we need to invest as much in humanity as we do in technology. And this is how we're going in Europe to keep our spot in the global economy. We're not going to keep it by selling out our humanity. 
and we're going to keep it by being more human, but supported by technology and science, of course. Our skills have to change. The old skills that we used to have that we learned in business school, I didn't go to business school, but you know, <laughs> I estimate that that's what you learned there. And now we have new skills like critical thinking, emotional intelligence, cognitive flexibility, storytelling. You know, when you talk to a human resource manager these days, you know what they're looking for in the new hires? Real people. Emotional people, people asking questions. This is the most powerful thing, and this is what our kids have to learn. And here in Finland, you know, you have some pretty advanced uh, uh, ideas about education that are already reflecting this, which is quite interesting. You know, we're pretty far away from this in, in Switzerland ourselves. But so this is the balance: right? EQ, IQ. Do you really think you're going to prevail in a world where, where robots and machines have an IQ of one million by boosting your own IQ? How much of that is it going to be? Not to say it's not important, right? But we have on one hand STEM, and we always say that our kids should learn how to program. But really what they should learn is this, right? What I call hecky. Humanity, ethics, creativity, imagination. There will be no future, don't get me wrong, where the technology is not part of it. So going into the STEM business is a good thing, but you know, in 10 years, the, the machines will do it themselves. They will program themselves. So this is very important for our future to consider. So in a nutshell, this is our future. We can choose on the dial between great technology or not so great technology. And really what we need here is to figure out that we can get some guidance. And if your government is to give that guidance, because for me, it's all about the story of saying that we're going to be awesome humans, real humans, on top of amazing technology, not the other way around. And I think for that, we'll need some wisdom. Hopefully, we'll find it somewhere, maybe on Amazon. Thanks very much for listening. Yeah, thank you very much. Amazing stuff. And the question is, would androids dream of electric sheep or not? They would. Could they do it? Could they do it? <laughs> Perhaps not. That, that's, that's the Good that's, question. <laughs> so, so mean and, and, and making us more human. So basically, when we're doing it, we should all study, for instance, philosophy. I think we need to go one back one. to studying things that are not immediately monetizable. Mm. Like philosophy, for instance, arts, yeah. music, sports. All of the things that basically are the things that we can do best. I think today, if you're a programmer, you will have a job for the next five, seven, maybe even 10 years if you're a good programmer. But in the process of the next 10 years, we will tell the computer to program itself. Yeah. AI will take over, yeah. yeah. And it will take over. So that's kind of where we're going. And, and you know, nice words about Europe. And, and basically, we talked about this earlier as well, uh, with the sort of freedoms and responsibilities we have in Europe, we are starting to become sort of actually quite unique if, we look, if you look sort of on the global picture. It, it's not that common in the world to <laughs> yeah. have such a strong base for the freedom and responsibility. I think what used to, what used, uh, used to be a disadvantage for us, uh, which is to be slow and to have a past and to think about things yeah. and, you know, made us slow, that is now a huge advantage yeah. because basically all the fast stuff can be done by technology. Yeah. <laughs> so for us, it's very important, I think, that we unify in that way that we can also present a a large number of people who have this kind of belief eh, that we want to remain human. And in Europe, we don't kill each other that much anymore either. So that's <laughs> <laughs> yes. as it now, now sort of looks. But, but hey, anyway, then one question. If we are sort of like the good guys and, and spend uh, our time and concentrate on these things, what about the, the bad guys who are creating armies of superhumans? How should we deal with them? <laughs> what did you have in mind? Yeah. Uh, so I think especially like this, you know, we, we have comparable scenarios. We had nuclear weapons, we had two bombs, mm. and then we decided we're not going to have another thousand bombs. That would be ver end very badly for us. Mm. So we have a non-proliferation treaty, yeah. which is working even with Iran and North Korea. Yeah. So that's one example that's very painful, but it's kind of working. We're going to need the same thing for artificial intelligence. But so like, yeah, if you start creating these guys, then we promise to do it as well. So yeah. better not create them because you... Well, I think no, nobody lives alone on the planet, right? Yeah. So even in China, where lots of people are saying that China is the main issue yeah. here, right? I don't believe it. I think that every country in the world has to play by the 
very existential rules that we're going to lay down in the next 10 years, which includes, for example, not having weapon systems that do their own killing without human supervision. Yeah. Right? Or building a super soldier based on genetic engineering and just letting the germline deteriorate. You know, that's not something you can do in one country. Yeah. Right? Okay. So we're going to need a lot of collaboration there, but I think we have a runway of five, seven, ten years to achieve that. Hey, thank you very much. And thank you for the book. You're welcome. I, I, will, I will read it, I promise. <laughs> Thanks. I have two yes, more books here if you want. Great. Hey, okay. let's give a big, big round thank of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much.